<sighs> Always powered by coffee each and every time. That is a mighty psycho promise, ladies and gentlemen. You are, of course, watching the mighty psycho Tuesday afternoon. Tuesday afternoon. But you know what? I thought I'd have maybe a quick broadcast. I like these little quick broadcasts. Um, before we even get into things, just to let you know that, uh, you know, with the new laptop, uh, I've got a mild issue. It appears I'm going to have to go get myself a, um, a camera, if you will, because for some stupid reason, it's not recognizing the camera that's in the laptop. The microphone, yes. The camera, no, which is strange, but whatever. Anyways, I thought I'd just simply come on here for maybe about 45 minutes or an hour or something like that, because unfortunately, I'm pulling a half shift today at work, and i got to take care of some family matters. No, not the TV show with Urkel, but i got to deal with that kind of stuff in a little while. Hopefully, it will go well. I hope, I hope, I hope. Uh, I just want everybody to have themselves a decent, a decent Tuesday anyway. I know we have a long way to go to Friday, don't we now? We do. Uh, before we get any farther into this, uh, excuse me, sometimes these things get a little bit, you know, I hate that I have to wear glasses sometimes. It drives me nuts. But for me to be able to, uh, ah, hell, to be able to even see some of the fine print anymore really screws me up. And I'm almost 57. My eye doctor, a long time ago when I was a kid, he's like, you're going to need glasses when you're 21 years old. Well, he was full of shit. I didn't need to even start having these until maybe last year. <clears throat> so uh, that just goes to show you what they may or may not know. Anywho, so uh, where the hell was I going on? <laughs> Another little symptom of being in my mid-50s. Um, but, you know, so I got to take care of some other stuff. And I'm still hoping to have... A broadcast tomorrow as well so this is like a bonus broadcast but i have to go get myself a uh, uh webcam if you will for the new laptop which i like actually uh, it does go a little faster than this seriously uh, this is of course being on a tablet so uh i don't know i hope everybody out there is doing decent i'll tell you boy oh boy was that rate show a long one today wasn't it i, I I, it was starting to give me a minor headache. That's the reason why I left. That, and I was just like, I did have things I had to do. But, uh, you know, I can, I don't know. Don't get me wrong. I can only deal with so much. And that's just like in real life. I, you know, I'm maybe it's just because I'm getting older and I'm getting to be a, uh, as the older son of a bitch than just a younger son of a bitch, right? I always seem to be bitching and crabbing about something. I try not to. I try to have a nice okay outlook on things some days are better than others right gang all right so i went off and uh, like i said welcome to all you guys here to psycho here uh we called and entitled this episode elvis three-way that's the way it is well yeah we'll we'll get to the first part in a second um don't really have let's see that for once, I don't have a tribute here for, for this video, but I do actually ask you guys to please have in your prayers. Um, her name is Carol. She has been hospitalized since Saturday. It appears that she's got pneumonia, and uh, I have not been able to go visit her. I feel bad about this, but because I got that stupid crud that's been going around and around and around, it seems to keep being recycled. It does not help if you work in retail or a school or a nursing home. It just seems like you, you, you try to get better. Next thing you know, oh, well. So let's see. So Elvis Freeway. <laughs> I happen to be reading. I'm about maybe about ooh, a fifth way into this book. It's actually a pretty good, interesting read, by the way, if you are into the Carpenters, especially Karen Carpenter. We showed this before a broadcast or two ago, but the lead sister, Story of Karen Carpenter by Lucy O'Brien, is the title of this book and the author. I personally, um, I had story time over Rachel's about the Ken Mansfield thing from 68. This time, though, I'll, I'll try to make this short, but I figured you guys might be interested in this because of who the participants or the almost willing participants or sort of, you, you, you'll get it in a second. So, the premise is this. 
you're talking late 1969, maybe early 1970. So Karen Carpenter happens to be friends with Petula Clark. You know, you know who I'm talking about. I, I know a place and all those other things, you know. Don't sleep in the subway. That kind of stuff. So, you know, Petula Clark and Karen Carpenter, they're both hanging out. And Petula basically asks Karen, hey, you want to go to Vegas for the weekend? Well, I'll come. Well, let's go see Elvis. Yeah, let's go see Elvis. 1969, 1970, you're talking at one of the primes of his career. Could even have been the apex of his career for that matter, too, after having all those semi-crummy and crummy B-movies, you know. All it took was Vegas to be the shop on for him, right? So, we get to the point here, and I'm, this is going to be maybe about a page and a half. All right. So, Elvis was then 35 years old and at the peak of his career, playing two shows a night at the International Hotel. Sinatra was a show, Elvis was a happening, said Joe Gar Garcia, the musical director for his Vegas shows. It was another world... The International was a mega resort with a mammoth showroom that had opened the previous year. So, yeah, 1970 here. Construction of the resort on the site of the old Las Vegas Speedway had been completed in record time, and Barbara Streisand and Presley were hired for the grand opening in 1969. That year, Presley did 57 consecutive performances and then returned every February and August for the next six years. After a decade of, like I said, bad B-movies and declining record sales, the International was where Presley would launch his career. The stage was 60 feet wide with a heavy gold lame curtain and fuzzy, fussy decor that featured crystal chandeliers and figurines of angels. In contrast to the glitzy showbiz surroundings, Presley would start each show with an acoustic guitar and barrel through 50 cent like hound dog and blue suede shoes with a burning intensity that rocked the crowd. Accompanied by, of course, in this dynamic band, James Burton, or kick-ass guitar player James Burton is, he's still with us too and gospel groups, the Imperials, and the Sweet Inspirations. The high point, of course, seven-minute rendition of Suspicious Minds. <coughs> Excuse me. Was a charge, yeah, seven, where there was blues whale and sophisticated soul. He painted a world of paranoia, heartbreak, and betrayal. But not that Petula, Clark, and Karen saw the show, they were recognized by the doorman and given the full VIP treatment. He was on form wearing his white jumpsuit. He looked beautiful, and the place was jumping, said Petula. Karen, too, was blown away by the performance, that face. We worshipped Elvis. We'd gone as guests. I couldn't have cared less about our gig. I just wanted to go see Elvis. Walked out, my heart stopped. I've been watching him for as long as I can remember. He was not only gorgeous, his voice was beautiful, and his talent immense that she recalled. At the end of the show, the Mater D came over to Karen and Clark saying, Mr. Presley would like to see you. They were led backstage through the dressing room to an area where Presley's entourage, a collection of guys known as the Memphis Mafia, were lounging and having a drink. Elvis had been in a big changing room getting out of his jumpsuit. Then he walked in absolutely gorgeous, said Padula. We were looking at him and he was looking at us. He seemed thrilled. Someone gave him a signal and suddenly all the Memphis Mafia left. Presley could be an edgy presence. As Joanne Shufi, wife of International Hotel President Alex Shufi and a former Miss Nevada remembered, he used to mess up the suite so bad, we had to redo it every time he was here. There. They all dyed their hair, and there was black dye all over the walls. And at one time, he shot the TV with a gun. Well, we've heard that a few times, right? I mean, he was wild. He was not nice in a room. The night that he met Karen and Clark, however, President came across as the perfect Southern gentleman chatting with them and drinking wine. He was coming on to both of us. Karen was a pretty naive 20-year-old, but I was a married woman living in Paris. I could tell he was keen on both of us at the same time, and he got started to get a little too flirty, said Petula. She remembers standing up decisively. Well, Karen, you've got your thing in the morning. What thing? No one has things in the morning in Las Vegas, said Karen. Elvis glanced at Clark as if to say, okay, I get it. As they left, he stood at the door and threw her a look. 
According to Clark, they scampered out like a pair of frightened rabbits. I don't think Karen knew what was going on. Maybe Karen wasn't as innocent as Clark imagined, and she saw something in Presley that fired up her sense of adventure. The first time I met him, I thought he was going to drop dead in my tracks. I was just beside myself, Karen later said in a glowing terms. Most importantly, it was the elemental force of Presley's performance that impressed Karen and inspired her to be a singer. With his dyed black hair, powdery lips, and dark eyeliner, Presley felt free to express his feminine side as well as belt out those rock and roll numbers, while Karen loved to sing in a deep voice and play drums like a tomboy. Both of them were unusual artists with a certain adronic adron appeal. You know what I'm saying. That's right. So there's your, there's your Elvis three-way. <laughs> so close. Can you imagine that bit? I mean, you know, years later, maybe you guys have heard that story about Gene Simmons in an interview goes off and he says that he went, he found out the Carpenters, at least Karen Carpenter was in the same hotel he was at. He went downstairs to Karen's uh, room, knocked on the door, you know, as uh, as Gene Simmons, he figured, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to go screw Karen Carpenter. That was his words, not, uh, not anybody else's. And Karen uh, opened up the door, invited Gene in, and guess what? None of that happened. They talked until it was till it was uh, the sun came up. Seriously, and it was like fascinating conversationalist. There's a lot more to Karen than what anybody really thought. All right, so that was the first part of the title. Second part of the title, we'll get to it in a minute, but that's the way it is. Part. So I think I said last broadcast that I happen to have some other records that I held back uh, that I wanted to show you guys that I recently picked up. Hey, yes. You know, I haven't uh, seen you. That's P-S-Y-K-O. I have not seen you in a long time, Captain Spaulding. Rest in peace, Sid Haig. Anyways, so, <coughs> excuse me. I'm still trying to get over this crud. This sucks. But, uh, needless to say, so I found a couple dollar albums, you know, and then, uh, well, thank you. You know what, but truthfully, I'm probably just going to hang on to it till the end of the month, and then I'll probably shave it off, because, you know, it's going to get hot, it's going to start getting to me anyway, and then I'll regrow it back on Labor Day, but this only took me three months, and uh, I figure maybe by the end of Thanksgiving, I can go get that Santa suit. It was kind of serious. Of course, I'd have to go touch up like the, the little bit. It's about maybe what, 75, 80% white. That'd be really funny, though. Get a, get a secret, you know, semi gig, uh, off gig of Santa Claus. Ho, ho, ho. I could be a Santa on a VC. <laughs> and all those women VC can sit on Santa VC Santa's lap. <sighs> Boy, oh boy, women. Anywho, so let's see. What can we start out, shall we? Um, I found this in the shrink. I don't know. I haven't listened to it yet. I didn't even know who this dude was. But um, we got here Buddy Charles, Boogie Bods, and Buddy. Now, this guy here has been known to be a pianist and a jazz pianist. All right. This was filmed, was film, filmed, recorded at Universal Recording Studio in Chicago on the AFI label. Now, he did another album. This guy was around for a very long time, I guess, because this first album that he did for the same label, 1958. Yeah, so he's been around since at least the late 50s. This, like I said, is 1975, and if I remember correctly, he uh, he actually was around at least until the 80s, if I remember right. So, very interesting, I think, to say the least. I have not had a chance to listen to it. All right. You like uh, you like country? You know, like country western? I I like. Um, I always said, out of all honesty, that uh, I like old country music up to about 1980. Because it seemed like after 1980 turned into a whole different thing. All right, there's a lot of different factors that caused that. I think, mean, truthfully, Garth Brooks was an accelerant, if you will, in regards to how new country ended up being. But there was other people. It wasn't just Garth. 
But this guy here, this guy was on the gong show once. Yeah, he was. He was all over the place. I read his book many, many years ago, too. I don't know where the hell that book is. But um, needless to say, this, uh, this album here, which came out in 1979, good old Boxcar Willie. Yeah, sings Hank Williams and Jimmy Rogers songs. And uh, thing is, if I remember correctly, I gave a copy of this. I just got this. And no, I didn't pay the three bucks on it. It was a buck. Uh, I think I gave my executive producer, Donna Jo Catlady, a copy of this exact album. Well, then I found out this album again, and I called my buddy Scott from up in Illinois. I said, hey, Scott. I go, you got a boxcar really autograph? Nope. Well, you do now, so I'm sending that, or at least giving the boxcar really autograph to him. But yeah, he was on the Gong Show back in the day too, before he, you know, got semi-famous, if you will. There was a lot of people, I guess, that got started on the Gong Show. Really, I mean. Or, uh, you know, not only him, but uh, Paul Rubens was on there. Uh, let's see, who the hell else? Well, you know, I mean, Unknown, well, did Unknown, yeah, Unknown Comic got started before the, yeah, you know, and, 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 you know, of course, everybody knows it's Murray Langston. That's yeah, but I like, I like Unknown Comic. He's goofy. Now, this next thing, this thing here is a colored vinyl promo from uh, the late 70s. Hey, Dwayne, how you doing? I know, right? You're not used to me being here at uh, 1238 in the afternoon. Like I said, I'm just doing a short broadcast today, but hopefully tomorrow um, we'll do a longer one. But the reason why I'm not committing yet to it is because my son is supposed to be... He's, he, you don't want to even see over the other side of this room. I'm in the living room now, you see. That's why you got the posters, because I got a nice work desk. My son brought that in, and uh, and we're going to get the laptop of his going here, and... Uh, Get the new camera, hopefully, for it. And, uh, hey, you know, we're going to hopefully have it fired up by tomorrow, I hope. But we'll see. But if you don't even want to look over here. There's bunches and bunches of boxes. And we're going to hopefully try to finish off uh, his moving uh, by tomorrow, I hope. That'd be very, very nice anyway. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But that's not where I'm going yet on this. I, I think I may have it on DVD, too, somewhere. But that's not where I'm going on this. You'll find out in a minute. Hey, guy. Hey, Nick. How's it going? You know, I was going to show up on uh, George's stream, but, you know, out of all honesty, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit that um, I, uh, I felt stupid. I actually forgot George's stream, and uh, I ended up going on Royce's. I was real busy Sunday. I'm not kidding you. I was on four different streams. Boy, oh, boy. You know, that's what happens when you're bored, right? And you go hang out with people. I mean, I remember that I started out at Joe Mayo's, and then I ended up going to uh, James, oh no, whatever. And no puppets there, thank God. And uh, then after that, went to Doc Dockus's, And then after that, a couple hours later, went to Royce's. So I was all over the place. I was I was skidding around like, like the VC, VC impish I am. But, uh, yeah, so I don't know. Uh, I, I, I need to probably get over there. I unfortunately saw the clip, and you know where I'm, you know where I'm going on this maybe, that uh, George kind of went off the rails a little bit, if you will. I don't know, whatever, none of my business. I just saw that, and I'm like, oh, my, that's all I said about it. Dobro, that's Dobra, that's the Polish or Ukrainian word for good. Nice. That's right. Nick's a great guy. He is, he is, he is. All right. Next little bit. <clears throat> so we have a uh, promo, like I said, col uh, vinyl, colored, colored, colored vinyl promo. Late 1970s. Some of you people already have probably have found this uh, in the dollar albums or in your collection or whatever. I miss these things back in the day, okay? And, and, and I mean, we're, I'm not even talking about like, uh, all right, I was, I was a sucker for those Warner Brother Lost Leaders. You know, the double albums with all the, I love the variety on that stuff. 
I bailed after five hours and haven't watched the rest. Is it still up? Because I am going to watch it when I have some time. Maybe tonight or tomorrow I may watch it, the rest of it. I don't know. We shall see, right? But I miss that stuff. I miss the Warner Brother loss leaders. I miss um, when these record companies would go off and put a track here, track there, you know, of all different kinds of things. Because, I mean, to me, that's the way these samplers should be. You know, you may not like everything that's on a damn sampler, but you at least get the opportunity to hear something different. Wow. I went from nine to three like that. Let's see. I don't know. My deodorant's still working. I don't know. Maybe it's just going to be fat and obnoxious. That's not going to change. Oh, shit. I'm not, was he trying to go for the record again? What's the record for? Was it, did, did Nick, uh, did George do the 24 hour? I'm trying to remember it like months ago. <coughs> I don't know if I can handle that, okay? I think the longest streams, you know, and like I said, one, if this all gets back to where it should be, okay, and I could start having people back on again, I think the longest stream I ever did was three and a half hours. After kind of three hours, I start getting a little fried, you know what I'm saying? I Seriously, so it's like if a stream lasts more than three hours, either the topics have got to be very engrossing or it's just we got a lot of interesting people, which, of course, in the old days, I did. Of course, the thing is, is, damn it, I know you guys are probably sick of hearing this, but I miss Beans. I miss Kevin, damn it. <coughs> he was one of my best guests. And, you know, when you got people like that, <clears throat> you can't, you, you know, you know, I'm not going to replace beans. Come on. Beans is irreplaceable. But I just don't know if I'll ever get to that level again, really. Yes, the welcoming committee. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. I'm still trying to fight this thing. I've been going on this now for like a week or two. I hate this very much. I, and it also doesn't help that the allergies are kicking in down here. <laughs> so, um, well, uh, so no silly imitations today, okay, guys? Yeah, and you know what, though? I go back and look at my old shows when I miss them, the ones that he was on with me. Because he was with me on and off for about a year, I think, on, on YouTube. And uh, I just miss him. I ended up, you know, we ended up being, we we chatted privately, I would say, the last um, month or two of his life. We chatted on and off through Messenger. And, uh Yeah. It floored me, it floored me when I found out. And the thing is, okay, is that some of us, obviously, you know, the, the, some of the people we talk to are next door, or we talk to them on the phone a lot. <coughs> some are across country on the other side of the world. But in a very strange way, only through here do they feel like they're right next to you. And they're, they become your friend via distance. <laughs> Damn it, guys. I'm sorry. You know, I'll tell you, I'm sensing something, too. As everybody that knows me, or at least has put up with me these 13 years, these last three, doing live streams and such, <coughs> I try to be my own person. I don't really let anybody's um, points or decisions sway me in any direction. I will try to be honest 
I think mostly I think I am. I, I really try to be an overly honest person. Sometimes it hurts other people, but you know, I can sleep at night for my honesty. I can. Yeah, Dave, I'll tell you something. I really wish you could have, you could have met him, you know, uh, yeah, through here, you know. Good guy. Real good guy. But anyways, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, this isn't a Debbie Downer thing. Trying not to be anyway, right? Promo. So, Warner Brother Lost Leaders, other record companies will go off and do special stuff in this in, in, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know. And then CDs did it too. I've got a bunch of different promo cops from the 90s, you know. Some of the coolest ones I got are actually uh, Hard Rock Heavy Metal. I think I showed one of them before. It was Concrete was what it was called. They used to be attached to a magazine and things like that. And I got some, I got some at that time anyway, uh, on the double CD. I'll have to find it and I can show it to you guys next time. But you have some established bands, but you also happen to have un bands with demos. They were not signed to a label yet. And I think that's cool. Maybe online friends, but I'm closer with a lot of PC people than in real life. Sure, I could see that. <clears throat> I wish you could have met Beans. You're right. It sure seems that way, doesn't he? Anyway, in our private conversations, we never had any ill will towards anybody. <clears throat> I am very sorry that I'm hacking here, right? Okay. So how about this? Now, I know, have you ever seen this? It's Big Red Music. This is from Columbia Records. Here's the front. Here's the back. Okay. So let me tell you, for example, now this is a... Uh, I remember correctly, 19, yeah, 1978, that's what I figured. So, this is what you get on this album. Boomtown Rats, Rat Trap, all right? I don't mind some Boomtown Rats. Uh, Rat Trap, I like. Uh, I'm kind of sick of Don't Like Mondays. Whatever, that was the thing that kind of got them going. Uh, I remember Banana Republic. MTV showed a video a long time, and I'm like, I like the way it went. I know there was a political message under it. But I'm like, I still like the way it went. Now, I never heard of the Bliss Band. Bliss Band with Slip Away. Got me on that one. The Jan Park Band, Running After Love, parentheses, making it easy this time. Dane Donahue. I don't know who that is either. Casablanca is the name of the track. Eddie Money. Now, we all know the Money Man, right? No, it's not Two Tickets to Paradise. It's Rock and Roll the Place live version. Kind of cool. That's side A, side B. I've heard the name. I've never heard the music here. Jules and the Polar Bears. You just don't want to know. Phoebe Snow. I didn't know Phoebe Snow was on Columbia at that time. I thought she was with Shelter. Guess I'm wrong on that. Every Night. Uh, half the reason why I got this thing, Flint back in my arms again and if you know who flint is good for you if you don't flint is pretty much everybody in grand funk railroad at the time but mark farner how about that for very strange and uncomfortable eh seriously so you've got you've got don brewer mel shocker and um craig frost they're all in this band along with i can't remember who the replacement dude was Valerie Carter with the Do Rendezvous. And lastly, David Holster, Constant Love. And of course, it says Demonstration Not for Sale, 1978. Now, it's kind of neat. They give you the covers, the album covers of where all this is coming from. And it's beautiful. Yes, look at this baby. Huh? I love it. I have a uh, a Sparks album that's in red vinyl, I think, from this label. Beautiful stuff. So I cannot wait to actually listen to the rest of this. Like I said, I, I have uh, somewhere in the collection, I think, still. I have a gold stamp promo for Flint's album. They actually recorded two albums, but the first album was the only one that got released at the time. The second one was recorded, I think, in 79, early 80. And uh, 
that didn't happen. So, they are great. I, I, you know what? I do not understand what the hell the beef is between Don and Mark. Okay. I know there's some douchery. I mean, I've read different books on Grand Funk Railroad and Mark Farner's book. And I'm sorry, I think Don seems to be more of a douche than Mark is. You know, nobody's perfect. And Mel is kind of on the fence. You know, I don't understand. But, uh, so when Bruce Kulik left the band, you know, uh, late last year, I think it was. Yeah, like this December 23, I think. And he was there for a long time. He was there like, what, 20... 23 years roughly and they did not go off and mention for quite a while who the guitar player was uh, that was going to replace him. Well, everybody jumped on the fence and go bring Mark back, bring Mark. No, they did not bring Mark back. Uh, they brought in a gentleman. His last name was Caulfield. He was in the gods. Remember the gods from the late seventies? Uh, that's G O D Z. Uh, he is the new guitar player for grand funk. So, Anyway, yeah, taco. You know what? Now you're gonna make me want tacos. Damn it! I was a good boy today. Uh, I had a, I uh, I made a two egg cheesy uh, scrambled uh, with a wheat car low carb burrito thing. I have no fucking clue. It's tasty though. Unfortunately, I realized when I was going to go put the mild pico, I'm like, oh, there's fuzz on this pico. Oh, well. Yeah. Anyways, hello to everybody that's here. So, now we get to the part of the second part of the title. But before I do, please don't leave, okay? I say this and then some of you people disappear. Don't leave. I'm just going to go get some more coffee. I'm here in the living room now. I'm not in the kitchen. So it's going to give me an extra 30 seconds. Please don't leave. That's all I'm asking for. And we will get to the last part of this title. And we'll talk about some other things too. Like I said, this is going to be a short broadcast. Do not go. Take a look at my posters and pictures and stuff while you're waiting for me. I wish I had uh, theme music that you can listen to while you're waiting for me, but I don't. Nobody wants to hear me sing. Trust me. You and I don't use my own voice when singing. Uh, your call is important to us. Please stay on the line. Excuse me. And the next BC representative will be here to assist you shortly. As they play Girl from, from Ipnema. I know, I fucking said that wrong. I'm just tired. All right. Good, you all stayed. Thanks. I was like, yeah, it's a first. Yeah, don't go, don't go now, Nick. <clears throat> Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. All right. So I went to one of my regular haunts and uh, over the weekend, and this guy, well, he dumped about another hundred, hundred twenty-five albums. Well, let's see. The Ying Vey Malmsteen was gone. He had a copy of Trilogy. You know, I've got uh, Ying Bay's first album, but I don't have a trilogy one. I bought the first couple of Ying Bay's. I don't know what you guys feel about Ying Bay, but uh, at least in the 80s, he was pretty fucking good, I thought. You know, I even have uh, Steeler on vinyl, you know, him and Mark Ferrari and uh, never mind. Anyways, so uh, unfortunately that was gone. Uh, I got half excited, half, when I came across a copy of the 1988 Striper album in God We Trust. It was, a, it was a record club edition. I love Striper. I do. I only got to see him once in 86. 
you know, and, uh, but unfortunately the vinyl was fine, but the cover, the bottom third of it was just so wrecked. I'm like, nope, not for the price he wanted. So then I went and dug around the crates some more and I came across another album to add to my Nielsen collection. That's right. Which is that's the way it is. See? See what I did there? You guys thought I was going to be on the Elvis movie. No, Nielsen actually wrote an album called That's the Way It Is. Now, uh, this, of course, from 1976. On a record collecting standpoint, you're going to be looking at this kind of a label, though. It wasn't used very long. Uh, I remember they went from, what, orange to, yeah, I think this was your, between your orange and then going back to black by 77. So, I mean, I still thought kind of cool. So, here's the front, and here's the back. This one I thought was kind of funny. There's a little poster, as you see. It says Eldridge and Beaver Cleaver, USA. I'm like, oh, boy. Um, and then, of course, you've got Nielsen, God's Greatest Hits, which, the, of course, the cover was used for uh, do it on Monday. Uh, that was, God's Greatest Hits was actually the original title to do it on Monday because RCA balked at the whole entire thing. Um, you can't see it very well, but he actually has a Don Rickles album. <laughs> so he was listening to Don Rickles back in 76, and I cannot figure out the rest of the albums that he's got sitting there. But uh, still, nevertheless, kind of neat. So you have Gatefold, your lyric Gatefold, okay. Um, and then uh, on here, you got lots and lots of different people here. So, uh, in the course here, Linda Lawrence, uh, Linda Lawrence, no, not that, no, uh, yeah, Linda Lawrence uh, was in a band uh, I know in the 70s, but for the life of me, I cannot remember what, but uh, so Linda's on course, then you got for drums, Jim Keltner, he's on here, Claus Norman on bass, Dr. John, Van Dyke Parks, David Page from Toto, and James Newton Howard. All on keyboards. For guitar, you got Danny Korchmar, Jesse Indian, Ed, Ed Davis, Fred Tackett, of course, would end up in Little Feet, uh, Lon and Derek Van Eaton, which, of course, they uh, they were on Apple uh, in the 70s. I think they were a uh, George Harrison discovery, if I'm correctly. And they also would end up doing, I think, some stuff on Dark Horse in the 70s also. Keith Allison, of course, a uh, former solo artist and Member of Paul Revere and the Raiders, and uh, well, friends, friends of the monkeys too. Um, that's pretty much it for that bit. Uh, Bobby Keys on sax, Jim Horn also, and then that's pretty much about all the ones that are any semi-recognizable names. Now, what I thought was kind of funny, of course, is it also says Bobby Keys appears through the courtesy of Ringo. Records, which I knew about that short-lived imprint, but I didn't know that Bobby was assigned to that. So, and also it does give a special thanks, very special thanks to Ringo. So, really happy to have this into the collection. Uh, I'm trying to remember, I don't really have like, there's still a handful of Nielsen albums I'm looking for. Um, Let's see what the first two, Pandemonium, Shadow Show, and Aerial Ballet. I'd love to find original presses of those. Uh, and then also, let's see, Flash Harry, which was 1980. That was on Mercury Records, but it wasn't released in the United States. And yeah, I heard Flash Harry sucks, but I don't care. And then I almost came across a gold stamp promo of the Popeye soundtrack, but on one side was beautiful, the other side was scratched to holy hell. So I kind of got pissed about that one. Dave, what did I miss? I'm listening while I'm at work. 
I was just giving you a hard time. Nick Paul was saying, don't go away a while to everybody. I ain't going anywhere. Still listening. Thank you. Psycho always has the best titles to these. You know, and I'm going to tell you right now, I love doing this. It's like fun trying to come up. With, is some of it clickbait? Yeah, maybe. But we do, there is points to the titles. There's all, I always explain everything. Can you imagine, though, if Elvis really did do that three-way? That would have been something. He got caught in a trap. I can't get Anyways, Claus Woman on bass. I've never really heard him play. Mostly knew him as the revolver cover guy. Yeah, uh, Claus ended up landing in my universe other than being the revolver cover guy when um, I'm the greatest off the Ringo album from 73. He's the one that plays bass on that thing. True story, though, and I've heard this from multiple points. Paul was supposed to be there. He really, really was. By 73, things were a bit different. Paul was supposed to be there. It was just going to be for the one song. But unfortunately, he had USA visa problems at the time in 73. That's why he didn't show up. At least that is what I have heard. Am I wrong? Could be, but that's what I read. Now, Claus briefly also was a member of Manfred Mann in the 60s. If I remember correctly, I think he was only on the Flamingo album, but I could be wrong on that. I know, right? I think that's half of his charm, to tell you the honest truth. I mean, see, I bet you... I bet you've heard them all over London. Yeah, Plastic Ono Band, Imagine, Ringo Solo Work. Yeah, Claus was all over the place. Um... But, uh, but as far as for, uh, excuse me, um, but for Harry, I mean, I would have loved to have met him. I already liked going to the Beatle Fest, too. Another one that you may want to go check, even though uh, I, I think I've got a copy of it. I think I finally found a copy of it. I think it was, a, okay, it was a tribute CD called For the Love of Harry. And it was a picture of Harry along with a bunch of school kids, like a choir or something like that, singing, right? And there's lots of different artists that take, um, they do songs of Harry's and do it their way. One of the strangest ones, but I kind of liked it, was Ringo and Stevie Nicks, of all people. This is, this is um, let's see, he died in 94. So I, I can't, I think it was 94, 95 maybe? And, um, they do lay, lay Down Your Arms, which I'm like, huh, I don't mind this. I like it. The whole CD is actually worth checking out if you can find it. I bet. Yeah. Uh, yes. Jim, how you doing? How are you doing and how is STL? That is cool. Seriously. I would have gone for that, too. Now, I don't know if I'm going to the Beatle Fest or not. It's 50-50 chance up in Chicago. It all depends on this, okay? Um, I mean, I want to go see my mom. You know, that's my top priority. Uh, Beatle Fest is probably actually in lower in the priority scale for my trip up there. But I certainly would love to spend at least part of a day up there. Um, I wouldn't mind going to torture Mickey Dolan's again. I mean, the last time I saw him was almost 15 years ago. Um, I would love to meet him one last time. Uh, but monkey-related news, by the way, new book coming out again, courtesy of Beatland Books. Actually, same company is putting out a new Kinks and a new Monkeys photo books. I cannot wait. These are unreleased photos. And, uh, yeah, uh, I still need to get Mickey's, Mickey's book. I know, money concerns. That's the reason why I haven't been able to do it. But I heard that there you can do payment systems, so I may go plunk down some on, on because I know there's a second printing of that book for Mickey, and I need to get it. Oh, yeah, what is that? Hey, Penny Lane, in my ears and in my eyes. Yes, indeed. So that pretty much, though, is really the, is really the gist of it. Um... Let's see, do I have any other vinyl to show? Well, I do, but it'll be more commercial stuff at the end because uh, 
You know, like I said, things things are a little screwy this week because of the move. You know, people moving in here, my kid. That's going to be another thing, too, to tell you the honest truth. Because of that, uh, I may have to readjust my schedule some. Uh, grandson will be coming here occasionally on the weekends. So Saturday could be quite interesting. I may have to somehow reorganize or something. I don't know how I'll do it. I'll figure it out one way or the other. But I'd like to stay on at least twice a week. And uh, I'm still working on the, you know, we're almost done with this season at Chewbox from Hell, which we'll get to that in a minute, too. Hey, James, how you doing? How's everybody doing today? I'll tell you. I, uh, I've got a half day at work today. That's why I'm up here. Uh, Matt and I got to go take care of some family business pretty soon here before I go to work. So that's why I'm up here now, just in case I can't get up here tomorrow. I don't know. We shall see. And if I do get to come up here tomorrow, we'll maybe go talk at great length about what I wanted to talk about uh, last broadcast, which is bringing up the current Guess Who crisis, uh, master tape retrievals, you know, not Guess Who, but in general, master tape retrievals and things like that. Um, I just think, you know, that, that'd be some interesting talking points, especially if I can get some of you people on screen with me. We'll talk about different things like that and tribute bands and such as well. But uh, so let's see here. Um, trying to think here. Oh boy, I got a slight headache today, guys. And no, it wasn't okay. Maybe I've had it since the, almost towards the end of Rachel's show when I was on. But I was already starting to get one anyway before it got all whatever up there. I I like being on there. I really do. I mean, if if I can add to the conversation, then great. If not, I know when to leave. I try not to stay too, too long on anybody's stream. Half an hour, I think, is about as much as I can deal with on anyone's stream, let alone Rachel's stream. Right, right, all right. So I think we're going to do the commercial and then we will do our wrap up, okay? so. Chewbox from Hell, ladies and gentlemen. We're up to 37 episodes currently right now. The newest episode, if you have not taken time to see it, is the 1986 album from Bad Company, Fame and Fortune. Here's the front. Here's the back. Um, newest episode of Chewbox from Hell up now. If you have not had a chance to see it, please do so. You might learn a few things. The next episode, which we are in the middle of research right now, from October 1968, Love and Spoonful's Revelation Revolution 69, The Love and Spoonful, featuring Joe Butler, that's right, on Kama Sutra. Here's the front, here's the back. And I let it kind of be known, I think it was in Doc Dacus's channel yesterday, Yesterday? No. Sunday. Today's Tuesday. Duh. Um, that we will finish the season of Chewbox from Hell. So that was episode 38 that's coming. Episode 39? <laughs> this thing. That's right. We're going to do 1973. Danny Bonaducci. <laughs> here's the front. Here's the black back. It's a... Uh, and it's even a white label promo, to Go figure. But that's all coming up to finish off this season of Jukebox from Hell. And then we'll take a six to eight week break. And then uh, we're going to get season four shored up and get that started. If you got suggestions for Jukebox from Hell episodes, put them in the comments. And I will look at them. Robbie, how you doing? How are you doing, sir? But, uh, but yeah. So we're going we're gonna to do it that way here. And... Uh, it's supposed to be 80 degrees today. It is now finally sunny. It's been uh, the sun's been trying to come out here. Hopefully, everybody is doing good in your neck of the woods, wherever that may be at. Um, oh yeah, and then the other thing too, which of course got announced today, May 8th. Let it be streaming on Disney. If you want to go see an interesting little reaction video, go to Matthew Street's channel. I commented on it. I made me laugh. I almost spit out my coffee when I was seeing that thing. It's only a minute and a half long. But, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, I, I'll 
I'll get it when it comes out physic physical media. I don't have Disney Plus anymore. My kid was the one that had Disney Plus, and because uh, I mean, I would love to see it again. I never had like Mazzy was showing the VHS. I yeah, I had it a long, 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 long time ago, and I don't know what the hell happened to my VHS copy. But I had a bootleg DVD uh, from it was ripped from the Japanese laser disc. And, uh, you know, it was all right. It was all right. They'll clean it up. But I'll get it if they put it back out on media. I'll get it this time. I still have to get to get back stuff. I'm so behind on my say. It's called this, guys. I don't have, you know, I mean, I'm always having to live on the cheap when it comes to this hobby. You know, priorities first. Food, rent, and bills, guys. Then down maybe about fifth, sixth on the list is vinyl. You betcha. All right, guys. I know. We're only at 50 minutes, but I did say that this was going to be a short video. Hoping to shoot for tomorrow. I'm not going to promise this very moment. Uh, we will see what happens. I'm hoping if I got some time, I'm going to go get that camera now, and maybe I can try to set it up between now and then. Uh, until then, I want you guys to have a kick-ass rest of the Tuesday. It is Tuesday afternoon, as the Moody Blues would be singing right around now. And uh, I just, like I said, I, I love you guys. I do. I have the best damn audience, the best audience in the YouTube VC community. That is a fact. All right? So take care. God bless. Rock on. Always powered by coffee each and every time. This is my second pot I'm working on. Shame on me. And... Uh, and like I said, I love you and take care, okay? That's all I can ask for. Anyone catch any of Sublime's Coachella show with Bradley's son on guitar and vocals? He sounds exactly... I have. I, I did catch a snippet of it, and it amazed me, Nick. So maybe Sublime isn't over yet. Rome being with them, yes, but maybe Sublime isn't done yet. And that's okay by me. Yes, indeed. All right, guys. I love you.